Testing, testing. Is it good to go? Good to go? All right. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Some people got rain on the way in. They didn't take a picture of it, so we don't really know what happened. So, man, it was getting so hot out there the other day. I saw a couple of those worms out there, or birds picking up the worm with potholders. So, we got problems. <laughs> Oh, you got one. Okay. Everybody got a lesson? All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, thank you this morning uh, for your word. Lord, thank you that you love us. Father, it's an amazing thing when we stop and think of who we are and where we've been, but your love. And I thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord, toward us. Father, help me as I try to teach this, Lord. Uh, some things are not real easy to teach. Lord, help me to speak the truth in love. I pray for understanding for the people, Lord, that they may see what's going on. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First John chapter two. Yeah. Yeah, they had a, a thing over there for women, the ladies to eat the breakfast. I uh, hope you got I'd made a suggestion on that, that breakfast. I said, when y'all get finished, could y'all come over here and, and serve us? <laughs> When I picked myself up off the floor two days later, I didn't think it was a good idea. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, first John chapter two. Read about four or five verses here. Notice verse uh, seven. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother he is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So as what we see, again, we started last week, and we uh, started talking about uh, some, some proofs that one really knows God. In other words, again, let me uh, reiterate some things. First uh, John, again, is written uh, to Christians. He, he says right here, I write unto you, brethren. Then he says, you know, and then we'll get next week, Lord willing, uh, verses 12 to 14, you're going to see uh, children, my little children. He uses that about eight or nine times. So we know that, uh, again, we're talking about people that have professed Salvation, talking about save, to save people. But at the same time, again, we would have to check our own lives because he makes some pretty strong statements here um, uh, about last week it was about commandments. In other words, he that saith that he loved God and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. We didn't, uh, the church didn't say that, God said that. 
In other words, the Bible says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And I will love him and I will manifest myself unto him. That's what Jesus said in John over there in 14 verse 21. And so uh, again, we see the, the, the ideal thing of what John is trying to get across is this thing of fellowship. Chapter 1 verse 4 to 7, we, we talked about uh, the fellowship there. It's found four times, the word fellowship. And so there are certain things that uh, say, in other words, uh, a person cannot say that he's in fellowship with God if he hates his brother. And because he's walking in the darkness. And in chapter 1 it says, you know, he that saith he abideth in him and walketh in darkness is a liar. Again, uh, the Bible's pretty strong. That's why I was saying in the prayer, when I was praying again, there's some hard things to be said in, in, in things like this in this book right here. And so uh, John is making it very, very clear. In other words, you ask yourselves, and again, we're going to get in exactly what is love. In other words, what constitutes what John is talking about here. And so, uh, again, uh, when you start talking about love, we're not talking about some sentimental, uh, some sentimental thing uh, that we're talking about. I remember back in the 60s, and I think it was 1967, John Lennon, Paul McCartney wrote, you know, this thing about love. In other words, then they wrote that, I love you, yeah, 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 in 1963. That's not the kind of love that John is talking about right here. He's talking about something that, that uh, come to dwell within us in, in the Holy Spirit, and He produces that love through us. And again, that's called the fruit of the Spirit. And so, uh, again, is what we're going to see is uh, this uh, some hard things to say right there. No. How do we know that if we really know God? In other words, uh, we talked about there's going to be seven tests that He gives just in, um, in chapter 2 from about verse uh, 3 all the way down to verse 29. And so, uh, uh, we'll just uh, continue looking, in other words. Um, and here's a, here's the thing. Do we love our neighbor? And again, when we start talking about neighbor, you have to really define it according to what the Bible says a neighbor is. We think there's somebody that lives next door to us that don't cut their grass. We call that, you know. Uh, you know when, uh, but anyway, uh, when you start talking about neighbor, uh, somebody come up uh, to Jesus at one time and uh, he says, and who is my neighbor? He knew who it was, but he, you know, he, didn't want, uh, he didn't like what Jesus was going to say. Jesus said there went a Samaritan down the road and you know fell amongst thieves there and he was beaten, stripped of everything he had, and left for dead. And along came this Levite. In other words, the, the religious people came by. And then uh, along came a priest, and we see uh, so, uh, some more religion coming by. But then that uh, that Samaritan came by, uh, or the, uh, another guy, and so uh, that hated uh, the Samaritans. Now watch. If we hate our neighbor, then we do not know God. That's what he says. You walk in darkness. And here's, here's the thing. No matter what we claim, may claim, or how loudly we claim it, we do not know God if we don't love our neighbor. You see, that the neighbor is that person that God puts in your path so that you can help them and be a blessing and strengthen them. And as Christians, uh, we can take the time. Sometime, if you want to uh, take the time and go uh, look up, there's a, there's about uh, one uh, some uh, sayings, uh, one another sayings in the New Testament as far as a Christian is concerned. Love one another, you know, uh, bear one another's burden. There's about fifteen to twenty, depending on how you look at the amount of them. But uh, there's a bunch of them out there, and that's what's called loving your neighbor. In other words, doing that. Uh, uh, to help them. You see, the believer fellowships with God by loving the brethren. I can't be in fellowship, in other words, with God if I'm not in fellowship w with uh, my neighbors, you know, the pe especially the people in my church. I don't like her. I don't like him. Uh, something terribly wrong. We'll get more of that in, in just a minute. God is love. You see, in the kingdom is a kingdom of love. Again, I'm not talking about this literal physical kingdom, even though parts of that will be there when Jesus sets up His kingdom. I'm talking about the kingdom of God now, which is in the heart. 
In other words, we're, uh, we're talking about righteousness and peace and things like that. Romans 14, 17 talks about that, that uh, type of thing. And so, again, uh, this love. You see, John had been talking about the commandments that we looked in last week, verse 3 to 6. In other words, uh, in general. But see, now he's, uh, he's going to uh, narrow this stuff down. His, fo- his focus is going to be on one single commandment. And you say, what is that one single commandment? Jesus is going to summarize all the commandments by the doctrine of love. Hold your places there in 1 John and turn to a very familiar Scripture to Matthew chapter 22. Most of us probably quote this once you see it. Uh, Yes. Look at verse 37. Notice what it says. Verse 36, let's just back up there. Well, verse 34, we'll kind of get the context. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were uh, gathered together. See, the Pharisees hated the Sadducees. Sadducees were the liberal group. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angelic beings. They didn't believe in all this stuff. They didn't believe in the, the hereafter, you know, heaven or hell and all that stuff. That's why they were sad, you see. It's, <laughs> verse 35, Then one of them which was a lawyer, and again, that's not uh, the, the people that we call lawyers today. These are the people that uh, had to do in writing of the Scriptures and had to do with the scripts and things like that. Ask him a question, tempting him. He didn't want him to answer. He just was tempting him, trying to trick him. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? In other words, he said the law. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as how? Thyself. See, we don't have problems loving ourselves. In other words, uh, and I'm not talking about this psychological uh, psycho babble out there talking about, oh, we just got to love ourselves and all this stuff. We already love ourselves too much. That's the problem. Uh, if you stop and think about it. And so turn, uh, hold your place in First John. Turn back to Leviticus chapter 19. You're going to see. Uh, we're going to read this and. But the other one, the, the more famous one, is uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5. But we won't turn to that one for sake of time. That one says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one uh, Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, body, and things like that. That's Deuteronomy 6, 5 uh, uh, over there. Now look in uh, chapter uh, 19 of Leviticus. Everybody there? Verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt, what? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, now who who says that? I am the Lord. So there's, you know, there's our, you know, thing that tells us, you know, what we're to do and how we're to do that. And so, back to 1 John. And so, um, we see this. Uh, so Jesus is going to summarize all of God's commandments. See, is what it sees what these people were trying to do. Uh, that 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 uh, lawyer that tried to trick him. See, the uh, the Pharisees, for the most part, uh, history has it that most of them could quote all 614 commandments, and so they thought that they could try to trap Jesus into saying, "Hey, which one of these broad spectrum of commandments is the greatest?" All, you know, and he thought he could trap him and say, well, this, this is the greatest. Well, what about this? And so they were trying to tempt him uh, and uh, trick him into saying something. But he knew what was in their heart. See, that's the problem. God knows what's in our heart. And so uh, by doing that, Jesus summarizes this, all of the commandments into those two commandments. And really, here's the thing. If I love God and I love my neighbor... I'm not going to be going across the fence and shooting him. 
you know, I'm not going to break that commandment, uh, thou shalt not murder. I'm not going to go, you know, messing around on my wife or with his wife because the Bible says thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or spouse, you know, if you want to place it like that. But I mean, all those commandments can be summed up into that because if I love you, I'm not going to bite, bite. I'm not going to tattle on you. I'm not going to, you know, go around saying things about you. Why? Because I love you. And love doesn't do those kind of things. That's why you see in, in Galatians 6, you know, uh, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, temperance against such there is no law. And so all those things, if they're being produced by the Holy Spirit and they're coming out of me, then I don't have to, you know, I'm not going to go around doing these other things. And that's why Jesus could sum it all up into love. Now, and, and I got to thinking about this. Think about how Jesus loved people. You see, everybody, won, uh, for the most part, except the Pharisees when they tried to you know, put him down and things like that because they thought they were, that he wasn't the Son of God, or he wasn't the Messiah, you know, and things like this. Think how he, in other words, how he treated people. Think about the woman at the well or, or in John chapter 4. What about the woman that was caught in adultery in John chapter 8? What about the, the people in, in John chapter 6 when, when he fed that whole group out of, out of love because the other guys were saying, you know, he says, how much food do you know, think it's going to take? Well, <coughs> there's uh, not even 200 penny worth, worth of bread. In other words, you're talking about 200 salaries for a year for people. In other words, all these people out there. But God fed them. He took care of their needs. Even though it, it's going to come back to haunt them, in the end, because when Jesus starts telling them the doc, speaking doctrine, guess what? It says all the people left him, all the disciples and everybody with the exception of the twelve. That's when he turned to Peter and said, are you going to leave me also? And so you see that all through the, uh, the New Testament exactly how Jesus... See, we become familiar with the stories. And so they don't really mean nothing until we stop and begin to meditate on how Jesus loved people. You say, what's the importance of that? Is because how he loved them is how he loves me, and that's how we should love other people. And so it's you know it's real simple. We all tend to know that theoretically, but not experientially a lot of times. Uh, and I, I remember reading a story when I was in Bible school, and uh, the guy was you know praying you know, before he got, when he got up out of bed that morning. He was asking God to you know put somebody in his life that he could help and, you know, do this. I want to love people like Jesus. And man, he, when he gets up and reads his Bible, he looks at his clock and realizes he's late. And so he goes scurrying, you know, down, down the sidewalk trying to get to class. And uh, he bumps into somebody and uh, practically almost knocks them down. Their books fly everywhere. And he just keeps going. You see, that, that's not love. <laughs> uh that happened to me one time when I, about the first week of Bible school. <laughs> I was rushing like that because I was going to be late, and I'm one of these sticklers for time, uh, especially the Army drill this into, you know, for time and being on time. And, and so I was going, and I actually hit, uh, bumped into somebody, a, a girl, and I just thought, you know, I didn't knock nothing out or something like that, but I turned around and said, Excuse me, I'm sorry, and uh, kept going. And, uh, and about five minutes later, I'm sitting down in chapel, getting ready to listen to the chap, uh, speaker there. And this guy comes over before church. He said, don't you ever touch my girlfriend again. He said, I, I, I'll tear you in two. And I just looked at him. Try it. <laughs> and come to find out the next morning, I look out in the hallway, and there's a guy sitting there reading his Bible, and he's like this. I mean, this guy was just all these massive mugs. You couldn't tell it with the shirt and the clothes he had on. The guy was Mr. Texas in, in, in these world competition for these waists. So if I says, I don't think I'll be bothering you anytime soon. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, Jesus, uh, again, talking about that. You see, it must be emphasized that the love that John describes is God's love. Um, now, now, think of uh, a couple of these statements I want to give you. It must be emphasized that the love John describes is God's love. In other words, it's a holy love 
that distinguishes itself between light and darkness. Look back in chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, This then is the message which you have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. And so on and so forth. And so, again, this love, in other words, it is, is able to distinguish between light and darkness. And so that's what we need is that discernment to, uh, to go about trying to do this as far as light and darkness. Because, again, if we're walking in darkness by hating our brother, guess what? <laughs> we're not going anywhere with God. You know, we might as well just, you know, say it out loud, in other words, until we get that thing straightened out. And uh, in other words, a love that is experienced in redemption. Uh, look and flip over a couple of pages, First John chapter 4. And again, John is going to talk through this throughout the, the whole book here. Look in verse 9, 4, 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. There's that love, there's that life that we was talking about. And in verse 10, hearing His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so we see this thing in redemption right there. In other words, it's a love that obeys God's commandments. We looked at that in verse 5 uh, there in chapter 2. It's a love that purifies. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 uh, where it talks about, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we shall see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And in that next verse, And every man that hath this, guess what? Purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And so this love and this thing like uh, what John is talking about is going to be able to work in our lives to purify us so that we won't be not ready when Jesus calls us home, doing something we got no business, or being so you know some place we got no business being. And so again, and so we said it's not the love's world. Uh, and again, uh, now look in verse uh, back in First John two there, verse seven again. This is a tricky, the way John writes this, you know, uh, it's real, the way it's written, it sounds tricky, but it's really not. Brethren, so he's writing unto the saved, I write no new commandment unto you, but the old commandment which you had from the beginning. Okay, what is, okay, I don't write no new commandment, but an old commandment. Okay, the old commandment was, we just read it. Uh, Leviticus 19.18, that's an old commandment. Deuteronomy 6.5 and 6 is an old commandment. It's back, you know, time. And so that's the old commandment. He said, uh, but notice how he write, writes it. I write no new commandment, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. What is the beginning? There the beginning has to do with when we were, when Jesus came, you know, as a babe and was in the world growing up and things like that. The Spirit of God led him, and he loved people. Everything that he did was about, you know, uh, loving people, trying to draw people to him. And so, uh, again, the old commandment, in the verse I quoted you, in other words, uh, in John chapter 15, uh, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And so this saying of God's love, it's not a new commandment because it's already been talked about from the beginning. It was with Jesus Christ when he came into the world. It wasn't uh, back in the days of Moses, it was the law. But now, when Jesus comes along, it's an experience of love because his life that you can see is outflowing with love by the things that he does for everybody. So, like that. So, from the beginning, when he come along. But now, for our beginning, this type of love that he's talking about is the day that you got your new beginning when you were born again. And the Spirit of God, it says, you know, filled us, uh, our lives. And so now we have the Spirit and we have the capability to say no to sin and to walk in love and to walk in righteousness and things like that because we have the Spirit of God uh, uh, living within us. So it's not, that's, it, that's when it was new for us as far as the commandment, uh, uh, the biblical love. Now, look at it again. 
which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. That's that Leviticus, Deuteronomy, okay? Now look at verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in Him. This new commandment of loving one another. Uh, remember in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, He said, a new commandment I give unto you. In other words, that you love one another. And that's, that's how he put it. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye what? Are my disciples, if you have this love one toward another. So he's already come along and he spoke this uh, love, but yet he was love. And so now it's the same with us. We can experience that kind of love because we have the Holy Spirit living within us. That's why he says a no, uh, new one. He said it's true in him and who else? In you. In other words, in us. So how does that take place? Just like I explained, the Holy Spirit lives within us. He can produce, if we're led by the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's what, uh, what, uh, what uh, the writer's trying to explain there. Now notice, because the darkness is past. How is the darkness past? In other words, since the coming of the Spirit, we are in, in a new age, so to speak. In other words, the dawn of a new creation. You say, and Christ is the firstborn of that creation. We don't have time, but if you want to, write down Colossians 1.18, where it says He's the head of the church, the first fruits of this and this and that. And so, uh, again, we see that... Uh, it was first manifested in Christ. Now, and the church age believers are the first fruits. James 1.18 talks about the first fruits. Romans 8.23, that's the verse I uh, quoted to you uh, partly a while ago. Uh, the believers, you see, when, when Jesus was here on the earth, when, uh, when He's walking around and doing and things like that, uh, the Spirit had not yet come as far as to indwell believers. And so they saw in Jesus Christ. But uh, He not only taught His disciples to love one another, but He gave them a living example of what He meant uh, by looking at His life. And, and so uh, we'll see that. Now, uh, the commandment was thus true in Him when He was here on earth, but now there's a sense in which the old commandment is new. In this dispensation, it is not only true in the Lord Jesus, but in believers. And so, notice what it says the next one. Um, verse 8, Because the darkness is past. When a person is born again, they are taken out of darkness. Ephesians chapter 2, And you who were dead in trespasses and sin. And then you're talking about in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, where it talks about uh, how that we were passed from darkness into His marvelous light. And so, uh, again, we have that light. And that's what John talks about. If you walk in the light, he's talking about the life that we just read a while ago. This life, love, and all these things, they fit together because it gives us a picture of Jesus Christ who was the light of the world. The Bible says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. And so, uh, again, uh, the true light, notice what it says right here. And the true light now shineth. You say, what is the true light? It's the gospel. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, where it talks about, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so now we have that light. And so uh, he's saying the true light now shineth. You see, wherever the gospel goes, it brings the true light to the lost. And we can, uh, uh, that's another thing that we can be really, really thankful for is the fact if we're in the light, in other words, uh, again, being in darkness was no fun. We thought it was going around doing and saying and being the things that we wanted to be and say. Well, guess what? Who was behind that? That was Satan. He was just pulling the strings, telling us certain things. And all we did was say, how high, how far? <laughs> And so, uh, again, uh, entrapment there. 
What could be more glorious? This great light shines solely because of God's love and mercy. You see, here's the thing about it. He had no obligation to save sinners who had rebelled against him. No obligation. That's his love and his grace that did that. And the more that we meditate and see uh, this thing about grace and mercy, the fact that of who we are and who we were, that's what makes it glorious uh, because of Jesus Christ. And again, because we can look at our lives and see exactly what we were. And I didn't like it. <laughs> Notice verse 9. It says, He that saith, here's this hard statement, He is in the light and hateth his brother is, present tense, in darkness even until now. Not in the light. You're in darkness. And hateth his brother. You see, John speaks of the light. In other words, and hateth his brother. Now I want you to think about that word hate there for a second. Because some people can get confused about that and think, well, I'm not saved, or I'm in this or that, you know, because I hate my brother. But I want to give you some kind of definition right here. Hateth, in verse 9 and 11, is a word written which refers to continuous, repeated action. In other words, you, you've got this hate in your heart all the time. In other words, again, and is what was, this is all about, in other words, it's not a momentary dislike or a fleeting anger that we may have because we can go back and get that corrected. In other words, if, if you do something and just cross my paths and stuff like that, uh, cross me up or something like that, uh, we might do something or say something. We've got no business and say, I don't even like you anymore or this or this. Or, you know, we just, in our minds. But see, God sees the heart. And so this fleeting, we can go uh, to God and if it was done to a person... We go to that person. God don't really want to talk to us because we're not in fellowship with Him if we're hating our brother. So we got to go to Him or that person and get that thing right with them. And you say, well, they did it to me first. We as Christians, would <coughs> or, or in other words, somebody that <coughs> has this kind of love is going, is going to go to that person and say, look, uh, <coughs> what, what is wrong? Uh, is there something I've done? I want to get it right. We can do that rather than waiting for somebody to come. They may never come. But I can try to, uh, the Bible says, live in peace as much as uh, lieth within you. We can do that and try to make peace with that. If they don't want it, then that's their, uh, can't do nothing about that. But I can do what I can you know, do because the Holy Spirit lives within me. I want to try to make this thing right. I don't like you know going around with a guilty conscience because I did something uh wrong, you know, and this and this and that. You want to get this thing, you know, right. In other words, and see here, the reason John is bringing this out, and we're going to see it later on, is because these false teachers and these false apostles were coming into the churches. And we, we, we talked a little bit about that in the past, uh, uh, these false people. And we're going to talk about it when we get down to the end. They're going to be able to talk about seducing people. In other words, having been able to draw people in with the false things, the uh, the false gospels and things like that. And so John is writing this because that's exactly what these guys were doing. They hated the 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 work of Christ so much. In other words, that they were you know, they were doing these things, and they hated the Christians. Uh, it's kind of like uh, in the four hundreds. Well, I think. Uh, what's his name? Augustine was born in 364 A.D. and he died, I think, in uh, 417, if I'm not mistaken. But he was one of these guys, in other words, in the, in the Catholic Church has really lifted him up to where he was something when he's, when he's not. So much so that even back then, they, they began to pass some laws because of the power that they had, these popes, that they, the power that they had, and they were taking Christians. Like back then, there was a group called the Donatists, D-O-N-A-T-I-S-T. In other words, and is what they believed 
is a church should only be filled with saved people. Strange thing. But the, the Pope and all those, those guys that were doing what they were doing, they were, if they didn't believe that, they were taking their property, they were killing them, they were doing all kinds of things, and we can read about this in history. It's not something that, you know, that, uh, that's hid under a rock. Uh, Pope uh, uh, Innocent I, uh, when he came along, uh, and stuff, they started passing, the, what they, uh, put out what they call bulls, and uh, these papal agreements, you know, because I got the power. And that's what all these crusades, that's what all this stuff was basically about, is the fact that uh, who's going to get the power? <laughs> really. I mean, when you boil it right down to that, it's, you know, who's going to get the power? <coughs> and so, you see people like that all through, they hated Christ and what He stood for, just like what John is preaching about these, these false uh, Christ here. Paul talked about him in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, uh, and also in 2 Corinthians 11, 15 to 19, I think it is, where it talks about false apostles and all these things like that. And then the devil, uh, he can go about changing himself into a, like an angel of light. In other words, he appears. We'll get to that when we get to 1 John 4 when it talks about Antichrist uh, and things like that. But we got all this stuff going on in the world today. That's why you see all these religions that sound good on the surface, and so people snatch that stuff, but that's not what the Bible teaches. You see, the, uh, that's the whole problem is, you know, the Bible doesn't teach those type of things, and so and that's why it says, you know, that the, the Word of God is, you know, is first, in other words, uh, inspired by God, uh, is profitable for doctrine first. And so, in other words, doctrine is what we teach. And so, uh, according to what the scriptures say, and so uh, this hate, you know, this hate and things like that. Uh, again, uh, one of the things that uh, there was a big uh, burn of the saddle during that particular time too. Well, uh, one historian by the name of Neander, uh, when he wrote about that, uh, it was this infant ba- uh, baptism. In other words, that you know was, uh, saves, and you have to do that, and things like that. Uh, and the Donatists, the ones I was talking about, they said, that, that doesn't save anybody. We're not going to have that. And that's when they started you know, passing all those laws and just chopping them off at the knees on everything to include killing them. There was millions upon millions. And, and as time moved along, and then you get to the Reformation from about 1450 on up all the way to the 1700s, this Reformation, uh, a lot of it was kicked in by Martin Luther when he nailed his... 95 theses on the wall there uh, saying uh, they, were, they were doing so much as uh, paying people these indulgences so that uh, they could do what they really wanted to do is what it amounted to. In other words, you're not going to look down on me. You're not going to give me my last rights. You're not going to give me this or that if this stuff has taken place. So they paid the money, the indulgences. And so, uh, again, you had people, these saints were robbed of their property, imprisoned, tortured, and killed. Man, some... If you want to uh, read sometime, read the Fox's Book of Martyr if you've never read it. It's a book, probably about 400 pages. George Fox uh, uh, was the guy that wrote it, but he takes all the way from the disciples or the apostles all the way up to about the 17, 1800s, and he talks about all these people that were murdered and killed and tortured and the kind of stuff that they went through. I mean, just for the sake of Christ, they tried to get them to recant. In other words, you go back and say that this, the, the church is, is, is everything we said it is, and you, you don't believe in this other stuff, and we'll let you go. I mean, they were driving, they were pulling their nails out. One guy, they pulled all his nails out at one time. The next day, they started, you know, doing the toenails, and, they, and then they started to fillet the guy. The skin, pulling the skin and stuff like that. You know, we're talking about murderous things when you stop and think about it. And these people were willing to do that for the cause of Christ. But yet a lot of times we can't even get on the street corner. We can't even talk to somebody about Jesus Christ lest they make fun of us. God help us. God help me. Notice what the Bible says uh, again, two nine. It is in darkness even until now. In other words, these these people they claim to have this superior knowledge. That's those Gnostics that we talked about. 
the superior knowledge. But John says they have nothing but darkness. And when we look at that from verse 9 to 11, you're going to find the word darkness four times. It's kind of strange how John puts that together and uses that word. Um, verse uh, 10, He that uh, loveth his brother, verse 9, is in the light and hateth his brothers in darkness even until now. Uh, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Look at verse 10. He that uh, loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling. See, if I, if I, you know, uh, if I have love in my heart for people, it's going to be hard for us to, for to stumble. In other words, to cause somebody else to stumble. In other words, they see my life, and if it's not, in other words, I say, I love Jesus. You know, got the bumper sticker on the back of my car. The guy, you know, does something, gets, gets out at the mall up there and starts to curse at you and stuff like that. And then you want to fight the guy. No wonder people... I think it was Gandhi back in the 20s or whatever uh, what it was that said, he said, I would be a Christian if it wasn't for Christians. <laughs> That's a true statement. But to a lot of people, talk to them all the time, stuff like that. No occasion. John contrasts the true brethren with the false. You see, the true brethren walk in the truth of the gospel and the Christian love. In other words, it's a path of spiritual stability and protection. They abide in the light. In other words, they remain there, they stay there, and they do not stumbling. And I thought that was interesting because I read a statement about that word stumbling. It's <clears throat> in the way they describe it, it's kind of like a word picture of what of how it does. In other words, it's the very trigger of a trap to where an animal hits that thing. To where when it hits it, in other words, when he hits that uh, trap, that uh, bait on there, the trap springs on him. And so this particular word is what it amounts to is there will be no occasion of, of, of allowing the Satan to, to do that and we stumble if we're walking in the light. In the light of the Word of God, and, you know, walking in the light as Jesus did. He that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Verse 11. That's a loud warning. You see, spiritual blindness is a fearful thing. I want you to think about that statement. Because we, we hear the Bible... And for regular, you know, if you go to church regular and you and you try to read the Bible and pray and do what's right and things like that, we should be fearful because the false teachers and their followers believe that they are in the light, but they're deceived. I've talked to the Mormons, I've talked to the JWs, I've talked to Hindu, I've talked to uh, Muslims, uh, you name it. And it's all the same thing as they they, uh, they want to try to sap you in by some program or something like that. You say, well, what do we have to offer? We have the gospel, the true gospel. That's what's going to change somebody right there. This is what's going to change somebody right here is this book right here. It's not our fancy saying. It's not something like that. But when we're loving people, genuinely loving people, guess what? We're going to change the the, the world's going to be, that's how the apostles did it. It says they turned the world upside down. And there was only 11 of them. I guess Jesus did a pretty good job. He had 11 apostles and one devil. John is saying that those who choose to follow the Antichrist or those teaching are blinded by darkness you see here's the thing light is available but man has a choice of whether to believe the truth or lies somebody said it like this I think it was might have been Bob Jones I don't remember light rejected becomes lightning I know Dr. Ruckman 
preacher used to say that. I used to hear him say that. Light rejecting becomes lightning and stuff like that. And uh, if we're not careful. But this thing of love, go home this week and just meditate on what God has done for you. And if you got ought in your heart against somebody, get that thing straight. Because we cannot fellowship with God or truly with others if we're walking in darkness. And darkness being sin. And uh, and looking at this week, I said, man, I just sat back and, and started to weep a little bit. Think about you know exactly what God did for me. And a lot of times we think we know what love is when in reality, if it's not according to this, it's not love. It can be a, a sentimental feeling or something like that. You know, I love mom. I love mom's apple pie. Hopefully not in that order. <laughs> So we got we got a problem. <laughs> anyway, uh, look at it. And next week uh, we'll start on verse twelve, Lord willing, and uh, we're going to see you know about children, about young men, and about fathers, and what that means. We're talking about maturity in the Christian life when it starts talking about that, because again that can become another stumbling block if we're not growing in Christ. Uh, and that's how Satan tempts us, and that's how he drags us away. Uh, if we're not careful uh, to do that. Tell somebody about Jesus Christ this week. Pass some tracks out. Do something for the Lord. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Word of God. That is truth. Lord, these are some, like I said, this is hard saying some of these. And you lay it straight. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to search our hearts. Lord, thank you for what you did for us. And I sure am glad, Lord, that somebody told me the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.